Sarah loves fairy tales, but she hates her fairly reasonable stepmother and constantly crying baby brother Toby. Jokingly, she summons the mythical Goblin King to take her brother away and is shocked when he shows up and steals her brother. Now, Sarah has only 13 hours to traverse the Goblin King's giant maze to get to his castle and save her brother and maybe learn something about herself along the way in Jim Henson's 1986 cult classic fantasy adventure, Labyrinth. I'm Connor Izagari. And I am the Goblin King. No, 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 I'm just kidding. I'm Josh Allred. And this is Filmgasm. <laughs> Happy Wednesday, everybody. Welcome to the Filmgasm podcast. Another round of our movie picking cycle ends here with Labyrinth, the latest pick from the elusive book of Filmgasm. We haven't delved into fantasy all that much on this podcast, so it's always fun to step outside the podcast comfort zone from time to time. Uh, but first, one quick update on the rewind. This one updates our past episode on the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And those of you who follow the Sneak Preview podcast know exactly what I'm about to say. We've got our first trailer and a release date for the new movie titled Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It'll hit Netflix on February 18th. Uh, You catch this trailer? What do you uh, what do you think about all this? Oh, I mean, of course I saw the trailer. I mean, when you live with somebody who is as adamant in his uh, tastes and opinions on the path this movie has taken, uh, yeah, I, my ears are acutely aware of what's going on with this thing. Um, I trying to keep it as its own thing. I'm cautiously optimistic, being that the way this series of movies, I don't even want to call it a franchise because it's been restarted so many times. It's not one story that it's telling. It's it has so far to me beaten Halloween in this choose your own adventure style on how you want to go about watching these movies. So I'm cautiously optimistic and I hope at least it's a good movie because I mean, what at this point, what, what else can they do to fuck this up? (laughs) That's true. That is, that is true. I've, you know, I've, I've only seen, I've seen the original, TCM2, the remake, and the beginning. That's all I've done so far. So I don't really have like a lot of thoughts on the Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise. I'm not anxiously anticipating this. I'm not dreading it. I'm just going to watch it and what happens, happens. That's that's kind of where I'm at with this franchise. Uh, I just hope it's, you know, it's worth my time. Yeah. Um, Did you did you read about the plot? I have not. I didn't know there was anything. I thought they were keeping that close to the chest. Nope. No, I think with the uh, announcement of when it was going to get released, that Netflix has just started an avalanche of press for this movie. And from what it looks like, it is going to be a direct sequel to the original. Yeah. And that it is picking up uh, on a leather face who has been hiding this whole time. And he gets brought out because of these four kids who decide to wander into his area and unsettle him. And I saw somebody on, I think it was Twitter. Somebody online had said, oh, they they made uh, Leatherface John Wick. Because in that in that trailer, they they showed him busting his door or the wall down to get his chainsaw out and shit. And it's like, yeah, OK, I could see that at the same time. Um, I just I just don't have high hopes, kind of like God, I was listening to uh, sneak preview today and kind of how you were about Dune. Don't have high expectations for it. And maybe I will be uh, pleasantly surprised. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, here's hoping. Uh, and if it sucks, well, wait a couple years and we'll get another reboot. <laughs> There's no faith another, in this franchise. No, but we won't get another Friday the 13th movie. So. <laughs> Hopefully in our lifetime, I'd like to see that continue just for you guys' sake, honestly, at this point. 
Uh, so this was my first time seeing Labyrinth. Um, Josh, I read your review of Labyrinth and you've clearly got a great affinity for this movie. So why don't you tell us a bit where that comes from? So being a child of the 80s, you had a lot of movies like this, uh, a lot of fantasy movies. And um, those were kind of the things that I gravitated to a lot when I was a kid. Obviously, the Muppets, they were huge. Fraggle Rock, I mean, I have the series <laughs> on DVD. It tells you anything? So this kind of stuff was very, made a big impression on me. And I think if you, if you remember my review towards the end, I kind of talked about how you don't really get a lot of that kind of craftsmanship in bringing movies and TV shows to life anymore. And it really does something to you as a viewer to where you actually feel like you're watching something that's living and breathing um, and not just, you know, a couple of keystrokes made it. <clears throat> so for me, it was kind of getting sucked into these fantasy worlds that were just scary enough to make me like really, really want to root for these characters. And then at the same time, these very happy, you know, now you can kind of see them coming a mile away, but these happy endings that really just like, anytime I watch movies like this, I'm always, I always get transported back to that feeling at like I was when I was a kid. And you just kind of ha like watching Labyrinth, I always have a smile on my face. It's such a great movie. I know it almost every line. I know all of the songs and it's just, it just, it's comfort food really really is and movies like this along with all the horror shit that i should have not been watching when i was seven eight years old all of that went in together to kind of shaping how i you know how i the movies i watch the books i read the stories i write and things like that so yeah i mean it was it, it, it came along at the right time for sure that's cool and you know i'm i grew up with a lot of 80s movies myself but this one completely pa passed me by uh I don't know really how that happened. I just never really bothered with Labyrinth. It took the the podcast and this random selection from the book to finally get me to watch this movie. And I'm glad I did. It's, you know, it's, it's wild. It's weird. It's hard to explain to people who haven't seen it, but it's fun and it's charming. And life, you know, Jim Henson was able to bring ridiculous characters to life in a believable way. I mean, you look at Kermit the Frog. If I ever met, like if I ever saw the Kermit the Frog puppet, I'd I'd have I'd get starstruck. It's weird. He made these puppets real people. I it's it's incredible, and he does the same thing with the uh, the characters in Labyrinth. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, do you you really you really find yourself becoming very uh, enamored with these characters and things like I loved loved the Muppets when I was a kid. And, you know, watching the Muppet Babies cartoon, all of that stuff was very, very um, important in my formative years. You know, Sesame Street, all that crap. It was just that was a way that, you know, it it was a uh, it was a very interesting vehicle they used to teach kids, you know, when you know TV was still kind of like an educational tool. Um, and now it's just kind of become this art form that lives on its own. So I, I really, uh, I really like sharing this kind of stuff with my kids to kind of watch them on their first reactions. And then I'm, I'm hoping they really love it. And when they do, it's like, yes, I got to win. So I can just keep watching this movie and not feel weird about it when I'm in my forties soon watching it with my kids. Yeah, definitely. I, I love the Muppets too, as a kid. Um, one of my all time favorite movies still is Muppet Treasure Island. Uh, something about that movie just n never fails to make me smile. Certain lines like when uh, Billy Connolly's character just randomly dies and Rizzo goes, he died, but this is supposed to be a kid's movie. <laughs> like yeah. shit like that. It's great. It's meta jokes. It's, it's great. And it's also a very cool version of Treasure Island with Tim Curry as Long John Silver. I mean, how do you not get behind that? So and that's and that's something that Jim Henson kind of got in trouble for with this. I don't and I don't I don't know if if you like read up on any of that, but we can kind of talk about it a little bit um, when we set up everything. Um, it's a really interesting way of how you can take 
something established like an IP that everybody knows, but then find a way to freshen it up and make it different and make it new and also make it for a whole other audience. I mean, I read Treasure Island when I was like 10, 11, something like that. But I was also the nerdy kid who read all the books. So I probably shouldn't have been reading it when I was that old, but I did anyway. And to see something like that, you're like, oh my God, like something I love as a kid, the Muppets did it. Fun fact, my high school, even though I didn't try out for it, they did a stage version of Treasure Island, but based it off of Muppet Treasure Island, not the actual book. So it was a lot more, it was a lot more comedic. Sadly, there were no puppets, but it was a lot more over the top like that. So if that says anything about how impressionable Jim Henson and the legacy that all the stuff that he came, you know, that that he brought out, if that says anything, I mean, that's says enough, really. That's awesome. I love that you're, they did Muppet Treasure Island. That's great. (laughs) <laughs> I love that. Um, my middle school did fucking high school musical. I remember I had to go watch them do it. Or No, the high school did it. And then my like our field trip in eighth grade was to go watch the high school do fucking high school musical. I was so upset. I, I would like, have stayed behind and done more work. Yeah, I wanted to. I, I tried to let the light. I tried to convince the librarian to just let me sit, stay there and read. But she was like, I can't do it. And I'm like, ugh. <laughs> They actually like a couple kids were like, fine. I remember that thinking like these guys are terrible. Awful, awful, anyway. awful. <laughs> um, so Labyrinth was directed by Oscar nominated creative genius Jim Henson, who was nominated for best live action short film for 1965's Timepiece. Henson is known primarily as the creator of The Muppets and Fraggle Rock, as well as the characters of Sesame Street. He also directed The Dark Crystal and the great Muppet caper. He voiced Kermit the Frog, Rolf the Dog, Dr. Teeth, Waldorf, the Swedish Chef, and Ernie before his death in 1990 at 53 years old from bacterial pneumonia. And yeah, his, uh, his legacy speaks for itself. The Muppets are some of the most iconic characters ever created. Same with Sesame Street, and they'll live forever. Yeah, and I think the fact that something you create continues to live long after you're gone says everything about how how amazing that that feat is to not only just make the muppets muppets are one thing i mean kermit the frog has been been just attached to the to the human consciousness at this point and then sesame street come on like that was that was huge huge and a part of so many kids' childhoods, like especially for me, and and probably you to to some extent, yeah. And it still exists today, still exists today. Like almost forty years later, it's still going. And I mean, it is it. It's amazing that some kind of art like that can come from the mind of one person, and then from there get put out into the world because at that point once it gets released it's it's no longer your creation and people either love it or they hate it and the fact that people loved it and it has continued to persist is is amazing i mean to do that once is a once in a lifetime thing he's done he did it consistently yeah he's one of the greatest artistic minds of the 20th century and uh yeah such an odd way to go he had like a weird bacterial infection that got super inflamed and took him out at 53 years old. It was such an odd occurrence. Uh, Yeah. It was a very sad day. Very, very sad day. Like I think I cried when I was a kid when I found out about that. It's a damn shame. Uh, But like I said, you know, Kermit, Fozzie Bear, Gonzo, Cookie Monster, these guys are part of pop culture forever. And, you know, and one day, you know, my kids are going to grow up on that. Their kids are going to grow up on that. It's just going to be an eternal image of people's childhoods. And uh, thanks, Jim Henson, for that. Uh, iconic and influential rock star David Bowie plays Jareth, the Goblin King, and also wrote and performed uh, the soundtrack. 
besides being the insanely talented musician behind such songs as Ziggy Stardust, Rebel Rebel, Let's Dance, Space Oddity, Fame, Young Americans, and so many more hits. He also appeared in The Man Who Fell to Earth, The Hunger, Zoolander, The Prestige, The Last Temptation of Christ, and Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me. Uh, Bowie passed away in 2016 at 69 years old after a battle with liver cancer, and the world never quite felt the same. I remember that being out of fucking nowhere and just stunning everybody. Nobody knew he had cancer, and then he just, he was gone. Uh, But what he left behind, much like Jim Henson, will last forever. Uh, The music, the performances, I think he's fucking hilarious as Jareth. He's supposed to be this evil goblin king, but I just get the vibe that he's having such a blast doing it that the evil doesn't really come across. You just see a guy having fun up there. Well, for me, like, absolutely. Yes, he is totally he's totally having a great time. For me, it was always this weird like way he was able to pivot on being very charming and very, you know, very manipulative, but with a smile on his face, but then be able to just really like turn on a dime and like, okay, well, I think I'm just going to kill you now. And just how he was willing to do whatever it took to get Sarah, no matter what, doesn't matter who he was going to have to kill, no matter what, what he had to take or how many times he had to do it, which I will get to. Um, There's some interesting little fan theories that have been floated around about this. And if you haven't read them yet, once I tell them to you, your mind's going to blow. I didn't read them specifically because I knew you were going to tell me the fan theories. <laughs> um, but yeah, like he um, also, have you ever seen the Venture Brothers? A couple times, yeah. Did you ever hear of the character The Sovereign? I don't, re- I don't remember. Okay, so The Sovereign was the head of the Guild of Calamitous Intent. And whenever they would... Um, have their little meetings the sovereign would come up and this is weird floating head and when it when the sovereign took human form it's david fucking bowie (laughs) literally animated to look like david bowie it wasn't voiced by david bowie unfortunately but the guys that did that were like who else are you gonna have david bowie like gonna be the most charming man in the world like of course it's gonna run an evil organization but built on henching people like of course so that's uh that's part of David Bowie's legacy as well as being an influence on a cartoon show that was ripping off Johnny Quest. <laughs> Do you ever watch um, Extras? I've heard of it. I've never watched it. It's such a great show. Ricky Gervais plays a a wannabe actor who's not very good, and he keeps fucking up all of his opportunities by being just completely tone deaf. Reminds me a lot of Curb Your Enthusiasm, and. There's a um, celebrity guest in every episode. He gets big names. And there's an episode where he runs into David Bowie at an exclusive restaurant. And David Bowie is inspired by his attitude to write a song about him that is so like just mean. And like, but he's writing it as he's talking to Ricky Gervais. He's like, stupid little fat man and things like that, like <laughs> composing it in his face. And Ricky Gervais is like, it's, it's David Bowie. So he doesn't want to say anything, but he's clearly like, this is wrong and it's it's so funny (laughs) no no the reaction you have is thank you david bowie thank you for taking the time out of your busy life to write a song about me you might be disparaging me you could be making fun of me i don't care you could be stay i could be having lunch with my girlfriend you could come over and full-on make out with her tongue down her throat and i would still say thank you david bowie thank you Yeah, he was a once in a lifetime person. And honestly, I don't think he even died. I think he just shed human form and went back to the stars. More than likely, yes. And we could only be so lucky to have been alive when he was here visiting us, gracing us with his gifts. Damn right. Well said. Ah, Um, Oscar winner Jennifer Connelly plays Sarah, the world's worst sister. Uh, Connolly won her Oscar for her performance in 2001's A Beautiful Mind and was also in Requiem for a Dream, Hulk, The Rocketeer, House of Sand and Fog, Blood Diamond, and Spider-Man Homecoming as the voice of Spidey's operating system, Karen. Um, 
and yeah, she's a terrible sister. Just the whole front beginning is like, I want to love fairy tales and shut up, you crying baby. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's hard to endear yourself, like the audience of the character, but obviously, you know, she goes through the hero's journey. But <laughs> it's funny that just straight from the get-go, she's like, I want to have a life. Why won't you shut the hell up? Yeah, yeah. It's like they like she's really painted as being kind of like a spoiled brat. Yeah. Um, and actually check out this 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 little back to back that jennifer Connolly has in her life so this comes out in 86 and right before that she does a movie with dario argento called phenomena oh where she is a young girl who has a special ability to communicate with animals uh including insects and she also shares the screen with Donald Pleasance. Oh, wow. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a great movie. It's got a great soundtrack. It's got a, it's got an Iron Maiden song on it, of all Jeez. things. Yeah, our Goblin has music in there. Like, it's a fantastic movie. It's totally wild. Um, so, yeah, I encourage you to check that out. But then straight after that, she does this. So, what a way to start your career. Yeah, absolutely. I was watching her um, Oscar acceptance speech because that's what I do in my spare time. And um, it, the announcer said that she got her first role in Sergio Leone's Once Upon a Time in America, mm -hmm. which hell of a place to start there. I mean, she just right from the get go is working with incredible directors. Leone, yeah. Argento, Henson. Holy shit. Like before yeah. she was even, you know, a grown up. Yep. Before she could even vote, she was working with fucking legends of cinema. That's fantastic. I will. I think the Hulk movie set her career back quite a bit, as it did with Eric Bana. That movie fucked with some people. I uh, I talked about that recently on the uh, Black Hawk Down Oscar Sunday because Eric Bana was in that. And every time I see Eric Bana, I'm like, oh, fucking Hulk. <laughs> and uh, yeah a damn shame it's been a minute since i watched hulk maybe i've maybe maybe i should you know you think it's aged better like would you bet i don't think so um i think one of the last times i saw it those stupid giant mutant dogs came around and i was like oh now i remember why i hate this fucking movie <laughs> and like the 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 cgi is not that good either like it you you like see Banna as the Hulk and you're like running around and it's like it feels like somebody was trying to make a living comic book movie and just totally totally fell asleep when they were doing all the color corrections and all the rendering to get everything right and he's just like what huh yeah 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 that's fine that's fine just make sure my cuts look like comic book cells that's all I really care about the world just like wasn't ready computer graphics were not ready for a hulk movie i mean hulk looks you know bloated he's got a freaking crew cut for some reason it's yeah there's a lot to, mm. look they can't all have lou ferrigno hair okay <laughs> let's just let's just go ahead and put that down there all right they cannot all be lou ferrigno just just can't that was a huge step back, and, and we're still paying for it as fans to this day because that's why Universal still has the rights to Hulk, and we can't get a decent Marvel movie made because of that. Yep, we can't get a Hulk movie. Eric Bana and Jennifer Connelly's careers never recovered. Like, Ang Lee pretty much stepped away from mainstream films after that. Like, yeah, that fucked everybody. <laughs> the only one who really emerged unscathed was... Well, no, Nick Nolte fucked himself in different ways. Never mind. <laughs> uh, Nick yeah, Nolte Hulk and unscathed right. should never be in the same sense. Yeah, no. Hulk smashed. He smashed a lot of careers. <laughs> God damn. I'm going to watch that movie just out of curiosity at this point. I haven't seen it since I was like 12. And I remember back then just thinking like, this, this probably could have been better. You don't drink, do you? Not really, but I might make you an exception. You probably should. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna exception. need something to help me out with that one. Yeah, yeah, well, you have to. You have to have just a little bit of fuck it. <laughs> just jump right in there. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Oh boy, uh, Labyrinth has an IMDb score of seven point four, Rotten Tomatoes score of seventy four percent. It was a box office bomb, grossing only twelve point nine mil on a twenty five million dollar budget, but received 
critical acclaim is now regarded as an 80s cult classic. That's crazy considering, you know, how unbelievably popular David Bowie was and how incredibly popular the Muppets were. Like, how did this bomb? I'm not sure. Um, I didn't really I didn't really see much in the way of like trying to describe why. Um, it's a damn shame because I if I would have been old enough to go, I was only like two or three when this movie came out. So like my parents weren't taking me to go see a movie at three years old. Good. So yeah, I mean, we can't all be like Joe Lynch, whose mom takes him when he's two years old to see Dawn of the Dead because she wanted to go to the movies, you know, different times, different times. So, um, but I mean, time is the great equalizer. And I think that definitely shows why this movie is as loved as it is and still works aside from a, one, maybe like one scene where you can really feel the uh the layering of the effects and everything but they were but they were taking big swings with this uh in the making of documentaries i watched um one of the one of the people was talking about it in like working with jim henson because he was always at the forefront of innovating and advancing puppetry and f filmmaking with puppets he was always just making shit up as he went along and they were doing early 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 cgi in 86 they were doing computer generated stuff and had george lucas of all people as executive producer <laughs> to help with that so think about that um i also think and it's definitely worth mentioning that you had somebody like Terry Jones to take the idea and write the screenplay for this. That right there, really like those ingredients all getting thrown into this pot. Fucking, wow, it's wonderful. <laughs> Terry Jones, I wish had had more input. I know that his original draft got very watered down. Uh, by just Dave Bowie's input and Henson's input, and by the end of by the end of this thing, it just it wasn't Terry Jones's anymore, and he lamented that. But you know that's the that's the curse of the screenwriter. You're, m most of the time, you're not going to get your vision on screen at the way you want it anyway. But still, I didn't know. You know, this has a direct Monty Python connection. That's that's still cool. Yeah. Well, I think you have to. I think you have to take it into, into, into consideration the fact that you have somebody like Jim Henson who is a, a creative force unto himself. And while he was very, very young in his like film, like film directing days, because he had only made Labyrinth before that, that you have to you have to understand like who you're working with. And from what I gleaned from the documentaries, um, the the story that Jim Henson put together, there, there are a lot of really great ideas. And it was like Terry Jones was able to put all of that together and, and create a screenplay out of it. And I think that's that's going to be Terry Jones's legacy with it. And when he was interviewed for it, anytime he talked about it, he always had a smile on his face. So I can't imagine his experience was totally awful. Oh, yeah. But yeah, I'm sure with the work that he's done, the movies he made with Monty Python and all of that, I'm sure he would have loved to have had more of his, his take on things to be put to screen. True. But I, then, you know, what would the final product look like? And I don't, would that, would the Monty Python humor mesh well with what Henson wanted and what David Bowie's trying to do here? I don't know if it would have. No, no, no. Cause I don't, I don't know how, I don't know how their sensibilities and their sense of humor would have would have worked in that world. Um, I kind of feel like the worm might have been like the most Monty Python thing in the yeah. whole thing, you know, because yeah. it's just this little worm. It's like, hello. It's like, <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm just a worm. It's like that. That to me felt very Monty Python. Yeah, yeah, it did. It reminded me of the. Uh... Like alms for an ex-leper guy from Life of Brian. <laughs> <laughs> an ex-leper? Yeah, this bloke Jesus cured me, stole my stole my whole bit. <laughs> Fantastic. 
Oh, so yeah, labyrinth. Let's uh let's just get into it. Um so the way this starts out, you know, immediately just with a great Bowie song and just an opening credits that, that is just fantastical. You're you're in for something. Like <laughs> there's gonna be an adventure here. And uh Jennifer Connolly is weirdly obsessed with fairy tales. I love that she's projected this evil stepmother thing onto her stepmom who's just like, it's date night. And I like, can you just show up on time? And she's like, you're ruining my life. <laughs> and she's like, I just, I, I just, what? <laughs> that made me laugh. Like just, she's just a stepmom. And she's like, why does she hate me? <laughs> Cause you exist. <laughs> That's where the brattiness comes out. It's like, you're just here. You're just ruining my life. Yeah. I love when dad goes up to talk to her. She's like, I don't want to talk. He's like, all right, well, we're going to head out. So here's what you need to know. She's like, yeah, you really wanted to talk, dad. Yeah. No, 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 no. Yeah. Oh, uh, hey, uh, I know you don't want to talk to me, but uh, your brother's asleep and uh, we're just going to go now. Fine. Uh, Whatever. Yeah. And she gets super pissed that one of her teddy bears is in her, like, five-month-old brother's uh, crib and she's like how dare my family take a teddy bear and give it to the baby (laughs) (laughs) this lady's insane well so like when she's when she's sitting there and i don't know how eagle-eyed you were with 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 the setup for this i had to point it out to caleb is when they're when the camera is panning through her room and setting everything up like you see stuffed animals and books and things that are all going to be in the movie later and Mm -hmm. that for me was made me go she made all this shit up like is all of this happening in her head you know like like clearly we already got the setup that she loves to fantasize and pretend she's in another world so it's like did she really do that um and i don't know if you could see she has that whole setup on her mirror of her clippings from her mom and everything. And that picture of her mom and the guy that's with her. It's David Bowie. <laughs> it's David Bowie. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, holy fuck. All of this shit is like happening in her head. Okay. So this is what I was talking about earlier. The books that are named, you got where the wild things are. You've got the wizard of Oz. You've got Alice in Wonderland. Um, I think there was another Maurice Sendak book. So all of them are right there. And this, this movie has a very kind of like where the wild things are feeling in that she's reading from this book and then she's in the world of the book. So much so that Maurice Sendak tried to sue Jim Henson to stop the movie's production <laughs> because he was saying that he was ripping him off. And ripping off where the wild things are, even though, even though in early, early in my film studies days, we were told that anything you see on screen is planned and everything has a purpose for being there. You know, it's used to describe characters, a place, you know, give you an idea of what's going on. Filmmakers can use it to put nods to inspirations for their stories and things like that. Maurice said that could have easily taken that as a nice little here you go buddy i like what you do this is what i'm gonna do with this nope i want my money fuck you you're not gonna fucking rain on my parade blah 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 so yeah um that had to get settled out of court for them to continue production so where the wild things are even though it's lovingly put right there in front of your face so you could get the idea that oh my gosh we're gonna go on a fucking magical journey yeah, no, that almost fucked this whole movie up. Doesn't that fuck with your image as a children's book author when you're attacking people like that? Like, but does it really matter though? Like, I'm gonna get paid. N- no, 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 it absolutely does. It makes you look like a dick. Yes. I'm oh. sorry. I write one book that is cherished and loved long after I'm dead, and somebody wants to put it in a fucking movie. Go right ahead. Because you know what that's going to do? It's going to get people to buy that book again. Exactly. Yeah, I've. That's crazy. I. He always struck me as an odd duck, anyway. So that kind of makes sense. Ah, oh, where the wild things are. I remember that's one of the first books I ever loved as a as a child. I had that. I would read that all the time. Oh, that's I mean, one of the books that taught me how to read. <laughs> yeah, that and Doctor Seuss, man. 
those mm. those books i read them shit out of them i had um cloudy with a chance of meatballs was one of mine and alexander and the terrible horrible no good very bad day you which... want to know what else i used to read a lot of what shell silverstein poems where the sidewalk ends yeah i still have my copy yep a light in the attic that picture <laughs> messed me up like what the hell there's a light in her brain what's going on i've got to read this shit <laughs> and that's the kind of stuff i hope to put into my own children's brains yeah me too someday that's great don't rush it no i'm, I'm enjoy I'm, your life i love my children if they ever hear this i love you guys enjoy your life make sure you're set up as much as you can be because you're never fully prepared never no, i mean i my whole family doesn't know none of us are prepared for shit like to this day i'm like you know how like when you're a kid you think your parents are superheroes yeah of course like, that moment when you like you realize like oh you're stressed out daily too oh that that makes me feel better yeah right <laughs> I don't have it figured out either. That's great. <laughs> um, so Sarah, who is pissed about having to take care of her baby, despite the fact, or her baby brother, despite the fact that she has no plans or probably friends. Um, when you're playing alone in the park at like what she's supposed to be like 12, 13, 14 or yeah, something like that. She's young. Mm -hmm. And she's just alone out there. It's kind of sad. Although I didn't like that. Stepmom didn't let, the dog go in the house that i guess that was her evil moment yeah right that's how you know she's a bitch she wouldn't let the dog go to the garage <laughs> it's like how could you how could you say no to that just give him a towel give her a give her a blow dryer let him fluff that thing up come on well the, well, the living room smelling like soggy sheep dog i i kind of get it but it also is just it's mean uh, so Sarah starts praying to the Goblin King, which is weird. And uh, I love that the goblins are like waiting for her to say the right words. Like, come on, almost there. <laughs> like, well, it's great say how it just happens out of nowhere, too. Like she starts saying and then all of a sudden you get to that cut and it's the goblins and they're all sleeping. And they're just like, oh, whoa. oh, wait, what? Hold on. Hold on, guys. There's something going on right now. Hey, wait. <laughs> and then it's just this playful back and forth. And that's where this like this weird like um very like tongue-in-cheek very fucking winky winky to the audience happens and she like the 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 movie is cueing you like the music is coming up and she's saying all these grand words and the lightning's crashing and then she's shaking her her brother and she's doing it and then they're like ah those aren't the words she didn't <laughs> even start with i wish and it's just like fucking hell and then at one point, she like it almost acknowledges what she what the goblins are saying. And it's like she hears and she's like, oh, wait, oh, maybe if I start it like this, you know, so it's like this little playful back and forth that kind of blurs the lines between already is starting to blur the lines between like, what is the what is the fantasy? And then what is the world of the movie? Well, what does she say right before that? She says, I wish I knew what to say. And that's when she's knows what to say so magic the power of i wish is important yeah <laughs> and some yeah. goblins off screen just gently encouraging you yeah and then jareth shows up and is like hey give me the baby <laughs> she's like you called me yeah <laughs> like order fulfilled and she's just like ah oh, i don't i don't know about this and he's like come on you don't even have a choice not to mention let's just Let's just take a second to bask in the glory and the glitter of the Goblin King's appearance. Come on. What man can come on screen with hair and an outfit like that, pop off in a fucking explosion of glitter, and you're like, this guy fucks. Like, he, he gets what he wants no matter what. And I'm not going to lie. I'm kind of like, yeah, I'd let him. Yeah. whatever you don't say no to the goblin king especially if he's dressed like that I, I feel like that's not even wardrobe that's like bowie just showed up to set with that and they're like all right sure that works roll camera a let's do this right yeah just <laughs> go ahead and take your mark over there yeah he's uh he's a mesmerizing 
force of nature. I, I get it. In more uh, ways than one. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, it is hard to look away from. Like, I think I mentioned we it all our, we, we all know what, what we're talking about here too, because <laughs> everybody that sees this movie and it was something I texted to you. It's just like it's it's haunting. You well, I was looking at the look away. I was looking through the letterboxd reviews and so many of them are just like, I can't stop looking at the bulbs. Like so many of them. <laughs> and there's even that, there's even that shot where Hoggle is groveling and it's just right there. It's right there. You're like, For a second on. there, I'm like, dude, like, what is he about to do? <laughs> like, I thought like he's about to like earn favor with the Goblin King. Like, <laughs> oh, oh, you know that's happened more than once. <laughs> Yeah, when you've got that guy running the kingdom, favors are earned in the traditional way. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> God, but seriously, like the the super tight gray pants and just like I don't know how much of that is Bowie and how much of that is codpiece, and I don't think I ever do want to know that. But God damn, like it's the only thing you can see. I don't even remember the, the song. Like all I was the whole time I was just like trying to figure out. The logistics of whatever's going on down there. <laughs> Shit. Uh, yeah. I and thank you guys for the warning, by the way. Just the constant, like the build up to that from you and from Caleb. I was like, this is gonna be like this is gonna be something. <laughs> and some like, if they felt compelled to warn me about it, this is gonna be something. And sometimes it doesn't live up to that expectation because. You could warn the shit out of people about something, you know, I'll tell some of these uh, movies really gory and they're like, yeah, it wasn't really that bad. But the fact that you're like, yeah, yeah it was hard <laughs> to look away. I, I, I'm still thinking about it right now. I'm probably going to have fucking Goblin King cod pieces fucking floating around in my head like sugar plum fairies. Like, yeah, it's going to be there. Little poofs of glitter. God, yeah, this is the most iconic crotch bulge in film history. Uh, honestly, and I don't. Of course, it belongs to David Bowie. Yeah, why not? Who else, Who else? could it belong to? You know, throughout the movie, you know, he's half, you know, half fairy, half, half angel, half pirate. Like he's all over the fucking map with with his wardrobe and his, like, yeah, it's. He is just who he is. There's no way to really describe him. You can't pigeonhole him anywhere. He just is David Bowie. That's right. All cod piece. <laughs> oh, yeah. Beautiful. So glad we had we addressed that. It had to it had to happen. <laughs> I don't even remember narratively where we were in the movie. Oh no, we're no, we're still we're still right at the beginning. Okay. You know, he, yeah. he he came into her room and he's taken Toby away. And all of this is just so he can get Sarah, which is creepy as hell, considering she's like 12. Uh, that's something that everyone's kind of just looked the other way on with this movie, which is kind of weird. Uh, well, it proves that a movie like this could not get made today with with that dynamic going on. Just wouldn't happen. There would be so many people that would be upset by that. Yeah. Uh, is this owned by Disney now? I feel like everything else is. It might be, but it's on Netflix streaming right now. Okay. So, yeah. Um, right. TriStar still owned, like TriStar released TriStar. it. So, I don't know if like they still have the rights for it. I know that this year is actually. This has been a really good year for some of our episodes. Like when we did the episode for um, My Bloody Valentine, it's 40th anniversary. This movie, 35th anniversary this year. Got a nice little 4K uh, with a bunch of, a uh, couple of uh, brand new extra uh, special features um, and like a nice booklet with some of the artwork. Um, there was even a book specifically of the artwork because the guy that did a lot of the art for it, he was also uh, the principal artist for the uh, creature design in the Dark Crystal, this guy Brian Froud. And Toby is played by a little baby named Toby Froud and Brian Froud's son. 
And when Brian came up with the idea that he had in his head of this little baby surrounded by goblins, he drew it out. His son hadn't been born yet. And the baby that he drew eerily resembled his own son. Just crazy. Just crazy how that just fucking happens. Well, that's some goblin magic right there. That's, right? That's creepy. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Um, so fresh into the labyrinth after Jareth tells her, you got 13 hours. You can make it to my castle. You get your brother back. Otherwise, he's mine. Then just kind of fades away. Which is cool. Like, this is his, you know, this is what he does. This is his uh, modus operandi. Finds a, this is his world. Yeah. He waits for some naive kid to make a wish, and then he just swoops in. Uh, Sarah starts walking through the labyrinth, runs into Hoggle, this weird little gnome guy who's incredibly duplicitous, and in the end ends up being a, a, a friend, but also tries to, you know, Snow White her ass. Uh, at the behest of the Goblin King. He didn't willingly, he didn't do it himself. But he also says he's a coward. So Yeah, but does that just give him the right to do to fuck over whoever he wants? Like, sorry, I'm a coward. You knew that. I'm not I'm not saying it gives him the right, but it it it, it is a big flaw in his character, and one that while it also makes him very endearing and loyal to Sarah by the end of things. It's it's also, you know, it's it's the other side of his coin where he is going to do and say whatever when Jareth is in front of him. But then when he's not around, he's like, yeah, fuck that guy. I don't like him at all. You know, I want to help you. And he's hoping at the same time, though. And let you ruminate on these things, because I'm sure it probably was a little confusing at first. When he, when Sarah introduces herself, he's like, yeah, I kind of figured that, you know, almost like he's, he's done this before he's, he's met more than one Sarah in his life. And it's really weird that it just kind of like, she doesn't pick up on that. Cause I think she's so focused on trying to find her brother that she doesn't really like, wait, what you knew that was my name. I mean, it could be written off as like, you know. Jareth already told him to be on the lookout for a girl named Sarah that's coming. But I got the feeling that it was something that has happened before. Yeah. Jareth is essentially, you know, an interdimensional serial killer. I mean, he's, he's done this many times. This isn't, yeah, I got that vibe pretty quickly. Um, Hoggle is, I think Hoggle's voiced by uh, Jim Henson's son, Brian Henson. Yes. Yeah. It's pretty cool. The Muppet family. And operated by like five fucking people controlling various bits of his anatomy. And then the performance was done by a little person who didn't like her voice acting was nowhere to be seen. She just had to do all the hand movements and her hands were like this big. And she was wearing these extensions of the fingers. You ever seen like the fingers, like the robot fingers or whatever, where you put your hands in and you can manipulate. That's what she had to use. <laughs> and there was a, there was a behind the scenes bit where she's trying to grab a handkerchief with those fingers. And it was the funniest shit ever. Cause like, she's like trying to do it. And these fingers are performing the, but they have like no strength in the grip. Yeah. And finally, like she finally gets it and everybody's like, yeah, she did it. Hey! And you're, but then you're like, holy fuck, like just another layer of how innovative they were. And to think about that, 35 years ago, they were doing something like that, where now that would all be motion capture. Yeah. And done like by Andy Circus. And it, w- it would look nice, but it wouldn't look quite as real. I'm, you know, no. I'm a big believer in practical effects over CGI whenever possible, because we see in films like this that it still holds up. It still looks real. It's a real thing in the frame. She's talking to this thing. Hoggle is real. And, you know, you look at a movie like, like what's a fantasy movie from the past, like five years? Like, is there anything memorable? Uh, I, I mean, I mean, you could think about anything that has any kind of computer animation, uh, any of the Marvel movies and stuff like that. Yeah. Like people are wearing motion capture suits and they've got a fucking pole with a, t- with a tennis ball on it. And like, that's your eye line. Look at that thing when you're talking. Don't look at the dude down here. Look at the fucking tennis ball up here. 
Yeah. Um, in the newest, uh, well, there's a newer one now, but one of the newest episodes of Curb Your Enthusiasm, uh, Seth Rogen is playing himself as he's playing in a uh, Viking movie. So put that image in your head. Seth Rogen made it look like a Viking with a helmet that won't stay on his head. <laughs> and he's got a fucking axe in his hand and there's like these stupid floppy octopus arms. And then there's a tennis ball sitting on top of him. He's like, all right, so what, where, what am I looking at right now? What's my eye line? Like, oh, the tennis ball right there. That's, that's its eye. And he's like, oh, all right. You know, so it's like, even actors themselves have said that they would much rather have something organic, something living, breathing in front of them to be able to work against versus something that is going to give you nothing in return. And you can't base your performance off of nothing. Yeah. I remember Ian McKellen had a bit of a, you know, a breakdown, a reflective moment on the Hobbit set when he was just acting in a green screen room with no other actors. And they were just going to insert Gandalf's performance into the Hobbit performances. And he was like, what am I doing? Like, what is, what is this? Like, this isn't acting. And it's, you know, there's some, there's an argument there that it's really just movies are slowly losing a lot of heart and a lot of soul. And I think it's important to go back and watch stuff like this so we can remind ourselves that, you know, trying is always better than settling. Yeah, I think there's I think there's something to be said for trying to strike the balance and find a compromise that yeah. works with, you know, because something that is brought up a lot on like the movie Crypt when Adam Green and Joe Lynch are talking to other filmmakers and actors is the shooting schedules are only getting shorter budgets are only getting smaller and the reliance is becoming more and more on computer technology to fill in the gaps and do all of those things and with a movie like labyrinth which i would be very safe in assuming 75 80 percent of that budget went to the practical side of things and because a lot of it was shot um in a studio in england so they had a lot of control for like um, the house and the sets and those kinds of things. But even within that, they were using any and all tools in the toolbox to make a movie. You had a lot of sets, but you had the, the beautiful matte paintings in the background and you had, you know, the, the stage, the sets built on a stage to where everything was controlled underneath and all the inner workings and things like that. You think about that scene where um, the goblins first take Toby and how they're all popping out somewhere and doing all this crap. And it's just like, it's amazing. And, but you think, but then you think about the coordination and the timing and the planning that had to go into that. And then only to be seen for that split second. That, that to me shows a lot of thought and planning went into that instead of somebody going, Hey, I'm gonna draw this out. Boop, boop, boop. There's your things. They're going to do this. And when we're done, we're going to add the lighting effects to it. And it's going to look like that. And it's very boring to me. It's very disconnected. This you're actually working with people who love what they're doing. They're very enthusiastic about it. Even the little eyes on the, uh, on the, on the lichens or whatever, that was something that Brian Henson was like, you know, I like this, but I want eyes on them because I want them to turn and see, and they're all independently controlled Somebody had to figure out how to achieve that effect. You know, it was just a drawing. Somebody had to bring it to life. And I love shit like that. Love shit like that. Yeah. Everything. I love seeing the, the process, you know, and all, it reminds me of like, you know, making a gourmet burger versus going to McDonald's. Like, yeah, McDonald's is fine. There's nothing wrong with it. But, you know, every once in a while, I want to enjoy the meal. <laughs> and yeah, it's just something I'll always, you know, be an advocate for practical effects over CGI. I love bringing that up whenever I can. Yeah, I, I think that's why I was so excited about the Dark Crystal series when it came when it came out. I was so excited about seeing it, and they really went for it. They really went back to that old method. I, don't know, I hate that I'm calling it old, but this this other method of making a movie, and just how wonderful it was to see that all the work that people did for decades prior to that was still being used and still being expanded upon. 
yeah that that is cool i've i've yet to watch the dark crystal i gotta get on that uh certain classics pass me by but i always find my way there eventually it's okay that's all that matters is is that you get there exactly uh, i'm not gonna win the marathon but i'm gonna run that thing <laughs> it's all that that's, matters that's the most profound shit i've said all year i'm gonna write that down <laughs> you're gonna put that on your tombstone <laughs> Ah, um, so along the way, uh, through the, I love when she meets the worm and the worm's like, don't go that way. Oh, she would have had right to that evil castle. If she got on that way, like, fuck. <laughs> Again, very Monty Python. And, and not only that, that's another like really interesting trick that they did with perspective and the set design to make, and to make it look like there was only one way to go. And the worm is like, no, like things aren't always what they seem in here. You kind of got to kind of got to look at things a different way. And which is oddly enough, a metaphor for life. I mean, you can't always look at something from one angle and think that you're going to find the answer to it, which is another way of also interpreting meeting people and learning about other cultures and other things. The phrase that keeps coming up is don't I don't take it for granted. And that, yeah, it's very true. And she is taking everything for granted. And the second she doesn't, she can see a different perspective on things. It's, it's good advice. It's good life advice. Yeah. Well, and not only that, she starts to understand a lot more about herself in that she is a lot smarter than she thinks she is. And she can, she can reason with this weird world that is, that is in front of her and, you know, overcome this, obstacle that seems impossible which again all about life hell yeah i definitely i know i i think this is one of those theories probably but i i got the idea that this film is very much about growing up that this is a metaphor for you know adolescence into adulthood especially at the end when she starts putting away childish things so to speak oh definitely Uh, and she's and she's able to pass on that stuff to toby and she's and, and she's okay with that because she knows that it's it's safe to 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 grow up and to get older because a lot of that stuff is always going to be within you. Yeah. You know, well, I'm 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 a I'm a big I'm a big believer in never acting your age in a way, you know, like you're only as old as you feel. Yeah. And it's why I've, you know, I've gotten back into reading comic books and I still get, get down and play with my kids and, you know, get immersed in their world because it, it feels good. It, it reminds you that there are, you know, all that stuff is still inside you and it always will be. Yeah. One of my favorite uh, quotes I heard somebody say this, I think it was a comedian. He said, everybody gets older, but it's up to you to decide if you get old. And I, yeah, I, my whole family lives by that. We try to find the enjoyment in the little things and never, you know, we don't put away childish things. I'd never do. I still, you know, hell, this whole podcast is me, you know, still celebrating a love of film I've had since I was a kid. It's, you know, it's important to make time for things you care about, for things that are fun for you, to enjoy your life. Well, absolutely. Because if not, you're going to turn into a miserable shit. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You're going to be the evil step. Yeah. Also, I want to take a moment. And, uh, I don't know if you can hear him, but shout out to Caleb and his coughing for making a making an appearance in the podcast. Even on an episode, he's he's not on. We can still hear the the ghost of that cough. Yep, it haunts us. <laughs> not unlike David Bowie's bulge in this movie. <laughs> Full circle. All comes back. <laughs> That's that's a callback, people. If you know anything about comedy, it's a callback. Uh, um, Sarah runs into this big old Yeti looking motherfucker, Ludo, who I'm sure went a long way towards Maurice Sendak's lawsuit. <laughs> probably, probably heard about that. And he was like, oh, fuck that. No, 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 no. That's a wild thing. That's what that is fucking tell me it's a rock creature ludo no no (laughs) god can you imagine if toby's name was max (laughs) he would have killed jim henson yeah yeah he probably would have fucking gone to the studio and been like slapping with a glove like a dawn we duel 
he would own fucking Sesame Street. <laughs> like he would have taken everything away. It'd have been called Sendak Street. <laughs> Sendak Street. Oh my god. <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, Ludo can control rocks, and that's an interesting power. Uh, Comes in handy. It does. He's a Deus Ex Machina if there ever was one. Um, and then Sir Didymus, this weird little rat swordsman thing that rides a dog. <laughs> He's a dog that rides a dog. It's great. Was he a, Was he supposed to be a dog? I, I, either a dog or a fox. I have no idea. <laughs> Either way, he's a canine looking creature who rides, who actually rides Sarah's dog. Yeah. And Sarah never fucking acknowledges the fact that this is her dog. That really bothered me. Um, okay. According to Wikipedia, he is an anthropomorphic fox terrier. There you go. So, yeah. If, we're, if, if we want to get scientific about it, he's a canid dog family. There you go. So. Let's do it. And yeah, Sir Didymus is certainly one of the uh, one of the little stuffed animals that is sitting on her dresser as they're going through. And you're seeing all the the, the other little accoutrements in her uh, in her bedroom. Yeah. And I think was, he's probably he's probably one of my favorite characters in all of this. He's the most Monty Python thing in this movie. by far. Fuck yeah. That is the, the bridge from Holy Grail. Like, that's what that was. <laughs> The fucking the fucking hoof clapping and the neighing that Ambrosius does <laughs> for no fucking reason, no fucking reason. Like, but then you go, oh fucking course, a oh, fucking course. He's riding a dog like a horse. Of course, it's gonna have fucking clopping hooves and it's gonna fucking neigh. Of course, I laughed my ass off when I heard that neigh. <laughs> oh my god. And this is after the fucking horrific fart swamp, which. Oh. <sighs> so Caleb had never seen this. And <laughs> when they when they found the bog of eternal stench, I looked at him. And I was like. Those are buttholes, right? He was like, yeah, yeah, those are buttholes. <laughs> Because, of course, <laughs> fart swamp, buttholes. Why not? Why not? So much noxious gas in this movie. Like, it just made me think, like, God, how far kids' movies have come. <laughs> and what you were allowed to show kids in the 80s. <laughs> just a swamp made of assholes. It's a different time. It's a different time. Everybody was comfortable about that, you know? Everybody poops is probably number one at that time. Everybody was comfortable with it. Yeah. And it's not like they were being subtle about it either. Like they were like wholesale, like medium to close up shots of these things just flexing and farting. <laughs> it was a swamp ass, a whole new meaning. Oh, does it ever? <laughs> uh, I, I really Hogwarts, liked. Yeah. Hold on. I, I really like when, when, when she met Sir Didymus. And he's just fucking doing all this grandiose shit. And he's like, you cannot pass unless you have my permission. And she's like, can we have your permission? And he's like, uh, <laughs> yes. I don't know. Nobody's ever asked me. It's just like, it's the funniest shit. I love that he's so dead set on like upholding this oath, completely apparently unaware that Hoggle had skipped by him like five minutes ago. <laughs> I thought Hoggle was going to fall into the swamp. Like I thought like they were, they were hinting at that through the whole movie. I thought his ass was going in the, in the bog, uh, but nobody, did. nobody, nobody did. I, good thing they had Ludo there to make a new bridge. And then the fart noise on every rock I felt was unnecessary. No, no. Oh, excuse me, sir. It makes perfect sense within the world of the movie. You're in the bog of eternal stench. Of course. Why would, any kind of ripple or splash not sound like a fart. Fair enough. I think I just had my fill at that point. <laughs> hey, I am a firm believer in farts are funny no matter what. You can never, you can never get enough if you're Fair the enough. one perpetrating the farts. That's I'll 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 put that caveat in there. Yeah, you're gonna yeah, you need that caveat. Otherwise, that's that's a fucked up statement. <laughs> Uh, 
Oh. <laughs> oh. So at this point, Jareth is like, how is she doing this? She should not be making it this far. Hoggle, do your job. Give her the peach. And Hoggle's like, I, I don't know if I want to do that. And he's like, Hoggle, give her the peach. And he's like, well, when you put it like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just gives her the peach. She takes a bite and forgets everything for a, bit, a little bit. And we get that weird sequence where she's in like a wedding dress or a prom dress dancing around the goblins, which I was a little confused about that whole bit. You got thought, any thoughts on that one? So that whole bit was kind of like supposed to be an exaggeration of things. And it's also another attempt by Jareth to, um, I'll say convince, to use another word, uh, Sarah to stay with him. Mm. And he's doing it in a very, uh, very flowery, very grandiose way. Um, the masks and stuff were supposed to be like all of the people there were actually goblins. But in this little fantasy that she's in, they're, they're just people wearing masks. And the masks themselves were meant to be exaggerated. So that's why they got these huge, grotesque noses and, and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, no, that was definitely another, uh, another tactic Jareth was trying to employ in order to, uh, yeah, convince. I'll say convince because there's definitely a lot more that's implied when you're looking at this. You're like, it's kind of fucking creepy, dude. Like, I mean, I know you're David Bowie, but dude, you got to respect the age difference. Come on. Maybe he's like 12 in goblin years. Maybe that's what a 12 year old goblin looks like. 12 year old goblins packing. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god <laughs> oh that was that was marvelous um okay so now that she, now that she's forgotten she ends up in a junkyard with this one vulture lady and she leads her to her like a mock-up of her bedroom and tries to convince her that it was all a dream and then just comes into the room like hey you need anything which made me laugh. Like you're supposed to convince her it's all a dream. You are part of that dream. Stay away from her. Well, and not only that, she's she's saddling Sarah with all of this stuff and all of these things. And so, all right. So this is I I, I all right. I guess this is a I guess this is a point where I can kind of bring out the, the this fan theory here. Okay. Because I. I kind of got the sense that the weird trash lady was another Sarah, one that got trapped. And this is this is coming from somebody's uh, post on Tumblr. They're known as Glam Damn It, and it was somebody's uh, sister asking them if the events in the labyrinth are meant to be a, a dream of Sarah's or are they real? And it's like, come on, you can't put too much thought to a kid's movie like that, you know? Yeah. And I love this. I love this in parentheses or any instance of David Bowie in tight pants. <laughs> However, this is their opportunity to put a lot of thought into this movie. So they're the, the question they posit. So why is David Bowie kidnapping a child from an underage Jennifer Connelly? And, the, and, and here's their story. In a, long, in a time long, long ago, a sorcerer named Jareth fell in love with a girl named Sarah. Sarah's father and stepmother would not let her marry Jareth because they wanted her to keep her. They wanted her to keep her as a servant to care for their other child. In a fit of rage, Jareth kidnapped this other child and spirited it away to the fairy world. In this new world, Jareth built a palace for his Sarah. He turned the spoiled child into a goblin, kept it to be a servant. Many stories of the fairy world tell us that time moves differently there than in our world. 13 hours, all that stuff. Why there's like no time that happened that passes from the events in the movie to where we find Sarah at the end. Uh, in the time it took for Jareth to build his kingdom, which he may have thought was little more than a few years, Sarah grew old and died. Overcome by grief and addled by a lifetime spent in a strange world filled with monsters, Jareth goes mad. 
He refuses to believe that he has lost his love. He searches the mortal world from his castle looking for her. Sarah is a Hebrew name, so it is common and has been in use for thousands and thousands of years. It does not take long for him to find a dark-haired girl named Sarah who has a younger sibling and who feels that she is treated unfairly by her stepmother. In a fit of rage, he kidnaps this other child and spirits it away to the fairy world. Perhaps this new Sarah dies in the quest to find the child. Perhaps she wins her sibling back and flees. Jareth searches the mortal world uh, from his castle looking for her. It does not take long for him to... So it's like, watch, rinse, repeat. The cycle continues to happen. This is how Jareth becomes the Goblin King. Every goblin in the Goblin City is a child Jareth has stolen, who is not recovered by a Sarah. He tells the current Sarah that Toby would become a goblin if she did not find him in time. This is why he builds the maze, the magic bog, the junkyard of useless treasures, all tricks to slow Sarah down. Because if he can only have his Sarah for the time it takes her to regain the stolen child, he will make it take as long as possible, keep her as long as possible. This is why there exists in our world a book containing the story, because, it's, because it has happened before so many times. At some point, some lucky Sarah must have returned to our world to tell the story. This is why, when the most recent Sarah first meets Hoggle at the start of the labyrinth and introduces herself, I'm Sarah. Hoggle responds, that's what I figured, because of course she's Sarah. They were all Sarah. That's fucking brilliant. That's, wow. <laughs> That makes this so much more unsettling. Uh, I like that a lot. But it, and it makes perfect sense based on everything we're given with the movie. You know, like so, a, a throwaway line that Hoggle says, like, that's what I thought. It's like, oh, shit. And that's why I say the trash lady is another Sarah. Like, she got lost. And she never she she ne she got so consumed by what was right in front of her that she forgot why she was there, and so she's just carrying all of her past and all of her memories on her back, forever, just stuck there. <laughs> I'm gonna have to watch this again. That's that's crazy. I like that. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I'll um I'll, I'll send you that so you can read it again. Yeah, definitely. Freaky. Uh. That's great. So the junk lady fails to, to uh, doesn't brainwash her. Didymus and Ludo show up and they make it to the Goblin City and they are confronted by, of all things, a giant robot. <laughs> Was not expecting that, but you know what? All right, sure. And that's when Hoggle gets to be a hero and he overcomes his cowardice and jumps on that robot and st saves them and earns Sarah's forgiveness. It's a great moment. Yeah, absolutely. I think like that whole that whole scene, like where they're fighting that robot, and then they go into the Goblin City, and there's just shit all over the place, and it plays out very playfully too. But it's also kind of like, damn, they're shooting cannonballs at these motherfuckers. I think one of my favorite moments in there is when one of the goblins is in the cannonball and it hits the wall, and he's like, "Oh, did I hit something?" <laughs> that cracked me up. That was good. I love when Ludo just summons the rocks and fucks up this goblin army. Just no, of out of course. nowhere. I mean, that's that that's what he's there for. He's the wrecking ball. He's the heavy. He's the heavy. Yep. He's your tank. If we're gonna <laughs> fucking talk fucking MMORPG fucking speak here. I love when that one goblin goes to Jareth and is like, um, you remember that girl you you brainwashed and like wiped her memory? And he's like, Yeah. She's like, he, she's at the city gates like she's she's coming and he's like oh my god <laughs> assemble the army like, he's concerned that was i love that it, it, that was funny <laughs> yeah well i mean he's i mean he's so convinced that he's he's done it and we actually we actually did miss uh the helping hands that was oh, another yeah. that was another great moment and i got to watch um jim henson talk with a lot of the other puppeteers when they were doing that and they're like, hey, you know, like, well, what's, you know, what, 
how does this look for for a face or whatever he's like oh well you know and he does he fucking he sounds just like kermit the frog so it's very hard when he's talking for me to just be like <laughs> it's fucking kermit talking it's fucking kermit talking oh well you know if you get this little thing right here like that's a that's a really good mouth and it's, it's a terrible impression but that wasn't like bad. he's you know like he's collaborating with these guys and talking about that and um one of the hands that they put up you know they're like oh wouldn't it be really cool if there's like a fist here for a nose you know so like it really shows how how eager he was to to work with everybody on every aspect of this and to make a scene like that even better even better and to trust the people that he works with to make an idea that he has even better than he has it in his own head yeah, he's very much, you know, I think believes in collaborative effort and making sure it all works together. He knows his strength. He knows everybody else's strength. And that's the that's the hallmark of a great filmmaker. Uh, the helping hands are creepy as hell. I don't like a lot of hands. That's that's an unnerving thing for me. <laughs> well, it was funny. I think I think I read about it somewhere and it might have been in one of the other pages where somebody was kind of hitting on this same fan theory. But they were like, yeah, like. It's it's a very unsettling scene to take in to, to like look at now, but then you're like, imagine if they would have helped her up. Where would they have been grabbing? You know, so it's like it would have been even worse. Oh. Uh, true, but why would she choose down, knowing that the labyrinth's up there? Well, but see, that's the thing though. Like she even got the advice. It's like, you know. What, what did somebody say? You know, sometimes to go forward, you have to like go back or something like that, you know? So she's taking this advice and she's like, well, maybe this isn't just like a straight line, you know? The labyrinth she- kind of like pulled her down, you know, like she thought she had the right way. You know, she when she thought she had that riddle lick, she was like, oh, this is great. And then, oh, shit, boom, down with the fucking helping hands. And I mean, yeah, she she did kind of figure out that she had made somewhat of a mistake because then she's in the oubliette and she, you know, Hoggle explains what it's for and she's like, oh, shit. But, you know, then Jareth comes and it's another little exchange between them. Um, did you did you ever try to figure out how David Bowie was so talented that he could uh, do all that juggling with those crystal balls? Yeah, I looked into that. I looked into the the guy who's standing just off, like behind him, doing the the tricks. Yeah, it's a very Michael, good angle. <laughs> oh yeah, Michael Mosher, uh, aka Michael the Magician, uh, and what that is called? It's called contact juggling. Oh. So it's not like balls in the air juggling. He's juggling. He's doing. He's doing juggling, but it's all that whatever he's juggling is contacted with his hand. And they were showing like David Bowie was very uh very good very good spirited about uh trying to get that and understanding that this guy that you know his his shtick he's normally looking at what he's doing so he can choreograph his hands and the the amount of talent it takes to do that is absurd but then to do it basically blind (laughs) is something else and the fact that they could nail what they could and you know if you really look you can see it in some of the shots but otherwise it's seamless and it's wonderful. And then you're like, it's such a simple way of doing it. Again, something that would have been done with computers and bullshit, whatever. No, fucking do it with people and you will get a much better result. I'm honestly surprised that David Bowie couldn't just do that. I mean, he can do everything else. Yeah, I know. I know. I was, I was actually shocked. I was like, wait a minute. That wasn't David Bowie. (laughs) Uh, the whole oubliette thing unnerved me because just the whole idea of an oubliette, once I found out about what that is, so fucking creepy. Just a play, a hole where people are thrown down and forgotten is so frightening. Uh, there was an X-Files episode called Oubliette that got under my skin. And it's just a, the whole concept freaks me out. So cool to include that in the movie. There's definitely like there's a lot of good. There's a good balance of horror in this movie uh, yeah. for the grownups. Totally, totally. And I think, and that's, and that's what um, kind of reinforces my point from earlier. Like it's, it's scary enough for kids, but then there are, there are like other layers to it. You know, a kid is not going to go in the dictionary unless they're me and look up what an oubliette is and 
then make the note, oh, hey, I'm going to watch this episode of X-Files after the podcast tonight. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to go watch that. Um, so, yeah, no, it's, it's another testament to just how great this movie is and, and how it's able to build layers in, into these things and kind of create this world that is like on the surface seems so safe and so innocent, but it's also very, very sinister, which again speaks to David Bowie's portrayal as the Goblin King. You know, could be easily passed off as being silly and not that much of a threat, but then when you realize the actual power he wields in that world, it's frightening. And then when you put it in the context of what I just read, he is literally willing to kidnap kids and turn them into goblins just so he can have Sarah for a little bit. Well, and if that's true, he has done this thousands of times. It's, yeah, that's ugh, it's a whole new layer of creepy to this thing. Yeah. Oof. But um, then he can serenade you with songs. Yeah. So really, like, how bad is he? Yeah, dance, magic, dance. Who, Oof. who doesn't, you know, tap their foot to that one? Always. <laughs> oh, yeah, it is just so weird that there's, like, just random bursts of music in this one, but it's David Bowie, so who, you know, of course, why not? Be weird if he wasn't right. singing. <laughs> of course, you'd be like, wait a minute, you had David Bowie this whole time and you didn't let him sing. Uh, so when Sarah uh, confronts Jareth, she has to do it alone because this is the hero's journey, and they end up in like an M.C. Escher painting, which is really cool. The whole st- weird stairs, of course, that would be like the heart of the labyrinth. Uh. And she takes him out by reciting the uh, the words from her play acting at the beginning from her labyrinth book. She finally remembers him and turns him into an owl, and ah, and gets to go home and finally realizes, you know what, the baby should have this teddy bear, <laughs> and uh, says to her friends, like, you know, I'll need you someday. And I love, I love that idea that like. Yeah, at some point we all have to grow up, but it doesn't mean we have to forget what it's like to be a child. And that's that's a, it's good advice. Yeah. Holy shit. I just realized we've gone this whole time and we forgot, for me, one of the weirdest and most unsettling sequences in the movie. And, it, and I'm not even talking about farting buttholes. I'm talking about the little fireies. Oh my god! Yeah, i i kind of I kind of hated that. I thought that was so stupid. <laughs> I mean, silly, yes, and it like, and you can really see the seams now. Like, I have um, I have a Blu-ray edition of it, and you can really see the seams in it. But then, when you see like all of the trouble they went through to make that happen, they literally used velvet, black velvet, fucking curtains. And backdrops all of the puppeteers were dressed in black they literally had to like vacuum off the slightest thing that was dust or dirt or whatever just so it doesn't catch any light because if it does it fucks up the whole process that they're trying to do and they had to like solve these problems and there was so much coordination going on and what it was and then like you have to think about these creatures that could like pull off their limbs and their fucking heads and oh it's so weird it's just so weird and it's so unsettling and it's a it's another testament to this whole like it looks innocent but it's really fucking terrifying idea that just permeates this entire movie i mean something that has fucking bouncing dancing heads the entire time and they're like oh hey why doesn't your head come off let's keep trying and pull your head like the fuck that leave my head alone play with your buddy's head that's that's most fantasy movies like to me there it's you know like goodness trying to prevent this ungodly evil from taking over the like the light of the world and so many fantasy stories deal with that trope, but there's so much sadism and monstrous fucking weird shit in fantasy movies that gets kind of overlooked because of how innocent it's packaged. And Labyrinth is definitely one of those movies. It's all over The Wizard of Oz. It's all over The Princess Bride, Alice in Wonderland. Like, it's just, it's, it's the way you tell the story that distracts people. And it's, it's brilliant. I wish I could write that good. <laughs> like, to just hide shit like that i wish i could do that 
Yeah, that makes two of us. <laughs> oh. So, in the end, Jareth, as an owl, looks in on the on the on the uh, Sarah's bedroom window, and you get this vibe that he will be back. Uh, but that ain't happening. There will not be a labyrinth too. It hasn't happened by now. Until this gets rebooted, inevitably, uh, we will not get more labyrinth. No, and I don't, and I don't think you you could. I I don't know that there is another another person who could pull that off. And pull it off in the way that David Bowie did. Not only that, like, I don't think you could find a, a, a singer that was also a pretty decent actor, you know, like, say what you want. But the fact that he worked with David Lynch and he was in The Hunger and he was in this, like, David Bowie's, David Bowie's a true artist, you know, like, the guy knew what he was doing. I don't think there's somebody out there like that now who could do that. They'd probably make it the Goblin Queen, make it Lady Gaga. I mean, it's not necessarily a bad idea, but I also think that the personality of that would kind of dominate anything else that happens. Yeah. It's just, I've you know, at this point, nothing is safe. Everything that was ever remotely a cult classic or a box office success is going to be done again. And it's only a matter of time before they go after Labyrinth. It's unfortunate. Yep. It's the way of the world these days. I fucking hate it. Um, here are three filmgasm facts. Number one, the owl in the title sequence is computer generated. This was the first attempt at a photorealistic CGI animal character in a feature film. That's pretty cool. Not bad. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't, I mean, it's actually a lot better than what we got from like, uh, was it? No, I'm thinking of clash of the Titans when they had that robotic owl or whatever. <laughs> I'll say this. It looks better than the Hulk dogs. Oh, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, number two, Michael Jackson, Prince and Mick Jagger were considered to play the goblin King. Jim Henson preferred sting until his kids convinced him that David Bowie, who had reached his peak of mainstream popularity with the album Let's Dance, would be best suited to it. Bowie wanted to make a children's movie, liked the concept, and found the script funnier and more amusing than many other contemporary special effects movies. So his kids were like, hey, this badass would be a great Goblin King. And he's like, well, I'm just happen I just happen to be in the market for a kid's movie to star in, so why don't we do this? I love that. That kismet is just fantastic. Yeah, and when he was approached to do that, like he literally like wrote songs on his own and just had like full like he did everything for it. He produced them. He had one of the people that were in like the Harlem Choir to like do all the backing vocals with him and shit, and he did all of that. Did all of that and came back to Jim Henson and was like, "Here you go. I did these." And they're like, "Oh, we were kind of expecting something basic." And no, we got full-fledged fucking songs. And it's just like you you get David Bowie to agree to your movie and say, hey, can you write some songs for us? David Bowie's going to fucking write you some songs. And they're fucking wonderful. I sing these fucking... Anytime I watch Labyrinth, I have these songs in my head for like weeks. And they just don't go away. And I love it. Yeah, David Bowie doesn't know what basic means. He's going to give 110% to whatever he's got going on. Uh, I mean, on his deathbed, he was doing, you know, that album Black Star, which was fantastic. Um, yeah. What a legacy. Um, and number three is, uh, you were touching on this earlier. Uh, the sources of the characters can be seen in Sarah's bedroom at the beginning of the movie. She's a stuffed animal that looks like Sir Didymus on her dresser, a doll that looks like Ludo on the shelves next to her door, along with the book Where the Wild Things Are, as the camera pans across her desk, a fiery doll on the shelves next to her bed, bookends with goblins reminiscent of Hoggle on her dresser, and a figurine of Jareth on the right-hand side of her desk. And I caught that at the end of the movie, where it's like there's this giant-ass statue of David Bowie's Goblin King on her fucking desk. And that just that made me laugh. Um, yeah, and there's even, a, there's even a little... It, it kind of looks like a carousel um, with her in that white dress Mm -hmm. right there there's the the mc escher drawing that was the set piece for the end is on her wall like that's what i was saying all of that 
is in her room. It's part of her world and her everyday life. So it's like if she is imagining something and she's making all of this up, why would it not be from, you know, why would it not exist in that world that she's pulling from what, you know, just yeah. like everybody says for good writing advice, write what you know. Yeah, just like the Wizard of Oz, you know, all of Dorothy's new friends look like the farmhands on, you know, in Kansas. Yeah, it's weird how that happened. Yeah. Why does the Wicked Witch look like the crazy bitch who tried to kill her dog? Hmm. Ah, yeah, I love fantasy movies. I don't get to talk about them enough. Um, I give Labyrinth an eight. It's eccentric, bizarre fantasy adventure. that still holds up. It is definitely in my Hall of Tens. Solid. I the fact that I can continue to watch this movie and not get tired of it, I've been able to share it with my kids and they love it. It's, it's one of these things. that's like a whole circle of life kind of deal. You know, the fact that it's, it's persisted for 35 years and it'll continue to, to, to go. Um, I mean, I, it's, it's part of my collection of movies. I love it. And it's, it's a testament to the work and the legacy of Jim Henson. Yeah. Well said. Um, thanks for listening, everybody. Hope you enjoyed this episode. If you like what we do, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Filmgasm Productions. Uh, if you want to suggest films to, uh, for us to check out, give us feedback. Uh, you can send us a message on the socials or email us at filmgasm at gmail.com. If you want to support the show, you can click on support this podcast on your preferred provider. We appreciate any and all donations. We hope you had a good time here. Uh, Next week's going to be a blast. Obviously, the most anticipated film of the year comes out next Friday, Spider-Man No Way Home. So we're going back to the beginning and discussing the original 2002 Sam Raimi-directed Spider-Man. Uh, even better, Austin will be joining me on that one, and we'll be recording from Los Angeles. It's going to be a fantastic episode. Uh, yeah, Austin and I are taking a trip next week to L.A. <laughs> ah, so excited. Um, how long are you guys going to be out there? About four days. We're going to the Academy uh, Museum that just opened up, and uh, we're just going to enjoy a trip we've been wanting to take for quite some time. That's fucking awesome. Uh, I encourage you to find uh, the new Beverly Cinema. Oh, we've it already is... got tickets. <laughs> what are you guys going to see? We were going to see, we wanted to do Black Christmas and Silent Night, Deadly Night. They were doing a double feature. Yep. We lost, we missed it. They were sold out. Oh. So, I managed to get a double uh, tickets for Scrooge and Christmas Vacation double feature. Shit, yeah, that's so, awesome. Yeah, we're gonna have a blast. We're so excited. <laughs> yeah, there's um, that's a place like on my bucket list of places I want to go. Um, I'll throw a shout out to uh, the Pure Cinema podcast that is run by Brian Sauer and Elric Kane. Uh, they work uh, very closely with uh, the new Beverly. Um, every month they uh, sit down and go over the calendar um, of what's going on. And occasionally they also have a, a guy named Quentin Tarantino. I think I'm saying that right. He comes on there and talks movies. I, I, I don't know if you've heard of him. Um, I think I've heard that name once or twice. Yeah. yeah so like he comes on there and talks um, and uh, the, the new Beverly also gets a lot of uh, Tarantino's personal prints of films, his own films, stuff from his collection. And that's what they'll get. And they'll screen his movies. Um, they'll usually have like a, a midnight uh, screening of a Tarantino movie. So it's pretty rad. Um, but yeah, yeah check we, them out. I, I, I hope you guys have a blast. He's showing uh, Django Unchained the Friday after we leave. I was like, I wanted a Tarantino movie so bad. But you know what? I love Scrooge and Christmas Vacation. It's not like I'm going to have a bad time. No, no, absolutely not. Oh, it's going to be so much fun. Um, don't miss a Best Picture Showdown on West Side Story on Oscar Sunday and whatever we got cooking up for Monday's sneak preview. Until then, stay away from the bog of eternal stench. Don't give your baby brother up to any goblins and keep watching movies. <laughs>